welcome to lecture the next lecture so in this lecture let's talk about nucleic acids and protein synthesis so in this lecture we'll discuss the components of nucleic acids the primary structure of nucleic acids the dna double helix dna replication rna at transcription and genetic code and protein synthesis finally we'll end the topic with the applications of genetic mutations recombinant dna and viruses so before you come to, before you start this topic i would recommend you to revise the to following topics forming amides drawing the zwitter ion of an amino acid identifying the primary secondary and tertiary and quaternary structures of the protein and identifying the factors that affect enzyme activity so now let's start with the components of nucleic acids so the general structure of a nucleotide includes three things one you have a base which is a nitrogen containing base you have a sugar and you have a phosphate group so these are the three main things that you need to understand the idea of a nucleotide so whenever you see the term nucleotide so remember that there are three things that are involved there is a nitrogen containing base a sugar and a phosphate group so there are two types of nucleic acids the one is deoxyribonucleic acid and which may contain several million nucleotides and you have ribonucleic acid which may contain several thousand nucleotides so in general remember that dna is longer than rna so dna is larger and a much more complex structure than rna so both of these are unbranched polymers of repeating monomer units we call we call them nucleotides so think of them uh, nucleic acids are basically unbranched polymers of nucleotides so each nucleotide contains three things so one you have a base that contains nitrogen a five carbon sugar and a phosphate so the bases in dna and rna are generally derivatives of the heterocyclic amines so the heterocyclic amines that are involved are two of them one is pyrimidine and purine so these are the two strap bases that are involved so pyrimidine is a single ring containing two nitrogen atoms purine contains two rings one is a pentagonal ring the other is a hexagonal ring combined in a bicyclic structure each of it containing two nitrogens each so there are four nitrogens here and two nitrogens in pyrimidine and four nitrogens in purine so in dna the purines here with double rings adenine and they are called adenine and guanine so there are two pyrimidines in your uh, structure one you see is dna and uh, the one is uh, cytosine and the other is thymine so cytosine is present both in dna and rna thymine is only present in dna so the pyrimidine bases with single ring with single rings are cytosine and thymine you have purines purines that are adenine and guanine adenine is present in both dna and rna also guanine is present in both dna and rna so in rna you have two rings again the purine bases of double rings are adenine and guanine so the pyrimidine bases that you find only in rna is the uracil so in dna you find four of them so we give them the shortcut uh, c t for pyrimidines and a g for purines so this is the ones that are present in dna only and in rna you get c u a g so in place of thymine you get uracil so the only difference in structure is the presence of a methyl group so is presence of a methyl group so if that methyl group is not present it becomes uracil if that that methyl group is present it becomes thymine so this is the difference here between the bases that you that are present in rna and dna that is the main structure that differentiates a uh, rna and dna and the second thing that then d said that can uh, separate a dna and an rna is the sugar itself the pentose sugars so the five carbon sugar in rna here is a ribose so ribose involves you have oh groups on all of the carbons except for the uh, sorry you have oh groups on all of the carbons except for the fourth carbon but the difference in a deoxyribonucleic acid is in this second carbon 
So there is no OH group present in the second carbon here. Both of them are H and H. That's the reason why the term deoxyribose. So remember that this is basically a ribose without the oxygen. So we are saying that we call it a deoxyribo with no oxygen atom at the second carbon. So the 5 carbon sugar also has carbon atoms that are numbered with primes to distinguish them from the atoms in the bases. So remember that the atoms are different and the carbons are different. So the carbons are named separately. So we always name the prime structure and prime numbering for the, the we just put 1 prime, 2 prime for the carbons to differentiate it from the other, other atoms. Next, the other type of an atom is called as a nucleoside. A nucleoside is basically a composed of a nitrogen containing base and a sugar. Remember that a nucleoside plus a phosphate group is equal to the nucleotide. So a nucleoside is a nitrogen containing base plus a sugar. Right? So this has a beta nitrogen glycosidic bond. So it generally bonds with the H and OH bond here and go out result in the addition of the nitrogen and the hydrogen. So this bonding occurs here and this carbon 1 bond results in either a ribose or a deoxyribose. It can happen with both a ribose and a deoxyribose. So the most common acid, most common sugar that it bonds with is adenosine. So we call it adenosine nucleoside. So a sugar and a base combine to form a nucleoside and H2. Next comes nucleotide. Nucleotide is a combination of a phosphate and a nucleoside. So for a nucleotide to form, you need a nucleoside plus a phosphate. So a nucleotide here has a phosphate group that is attached to the fifth carbon on the OH group of the nucleoside. So here remember that the nitrogen base attaches itself to the first carbon and the phosphate attaches itself to the fifth carbon. So the 1 and 5 are the main important bonds that you have to remember. So the, for the first carbon it involves the bonding with the nitrogen base and the fifth carbon involves the bonding with the phosphate base. So when phosphate and nucleoside involve it creates a nucleotide and it releases water. So there are, there are uh, in total 5 types of uh, nucleotides in total in both of RNA and DNA. First one is adenosine monophosphate. So this is AMP where the sugar is adenosine. Sorry, the base, the, the nitrogen base is adenosine, adenine. And you have guanosine monophosphate. So where you have guanine is the nitrogen base. You have cytidine monophosphate which means cytosine here is the nitrogen base. You have uridine monophosphate which, is, which means uracil is the nitrogen base and deoxythymidine monophosphate which is going to be resulting in the formation of a thymine base. So these are the five bases and out of them this is only present in RNA, it's not present in DNA. So the components in DNA you get AGCT as the base, in RNA it is AGCU and the sugar here is a deoxyribose sugar, here it's a ribose sugar. The nucleoside involves the addition of a base and a deoxyribose. In RNA, it involves the base and the ribose. And in a nucleotide, it involves base plus deoxyribose plus phosphate. In RNA, it involves base plus ribose plus phosphate. And the nucleic acid is a polymer of deoxyribonucleotides. And RNA is a polymer of ribonucleotides. Now, so the name of the nucleoside generally ends with, contains a purine that ends with osin and the name of a nucleoside that contains a pyrimidine generally ends with edine. So that's the reason why notice that it is adenosin because it is a pyrimidine. So it's a purine and you have guanosin which is again a purine. So remember that here the idea here is that if it involves a purine it becomes ends with osine. If it's a pyrimidine, it ends with edine. So this is how we can differentiate whether what type of base it is, whether it's a purine or a pyrimidine. Now the name of the DNA nucleosides add deoxy to the beginning of the name. If it is not deoxy, we, we generally write it as generally a, a general structure. So the addition only comes in when it is a nucleoside of a DNA. Now the corresponding nucleotides in RNA and DNA are generally named by adding a monophosphate to the end of the nucleoside name. 
So the monophosphate here is the one that ends up creating the final name for the nucleotide. So if the base is adenine, the nucleoside is deoxyadenosine for DNA and the nucleotide is deoxyadenosine monophosphate. So we write it as DAMP. So the D here represents that it is for the DNA. If it is guanine, you get deoxyguanosine. The nucleotide is deoxyguanosine monophosphate. So this way you also get the same for CNT. In RNA, the only difference is that there is no D, everything else is the same. But we do not have thymine, but in place of thymine we have uracil. Uracil becomes uridin and uridin monophosphate will be there. Now let's discuss AMP, ADP, ADP and ATP. AMP is adenosine monophosphate, ADP is adenosine diphosphate, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Now under condensation processes, the adenosine monophosphate can add itself to a phosphate resulting in the formation of an adenosine diphosphate and further condensation results in the formation of a more powerful and more energetic adenosine triphosphate. So this is the main molecule that is involved in the formation of many of the structures or many of the molecules in your own body. So they are asking you to here, so start to pause the video here and try to solve this problem. So give the name and abbreviation for the following molecule and it leads to its base and sugar. Now, let's talk about the primary structure of nucleic acid. So the primary structure involves the formation of a phosphodiester bond. So the phosphodiester bond forms between the third carbon the oxygen connected to the third carbon and the phosphate group attached to the fifth carbon of the next sugar. So this 3,5 phosphodiester linkage is the main reason why DNA in itself, uh, nucleic acids in themselves actually can create a linear polymeristic chain. So the primary structure of nucleic acids involves the nucleotides are joined by the phosphodiester bonds. So the 3 prime of OH of the sugar and one in one nucleotide bonds to the phosphate group of the fifth carbon in the sugar molecule. Remember that here it is the third 3 prime OH group to the phosphate group of the fifth prime carbon. Now this 3 prime 5 prime bonding is what results in the formation of this phosphodiester linkage. So this is the this is one of the main uh, important uh, bonds that results in the creation of the DNA. So it's always remember that one end you have a free 5 prime end and on another end you have a free 3 prime end. So whenever we write DNA structures we always write from write from 5 prime to 3 prime and in reverse we write 5 prime to 3 prime as well. So the base sequence here is the primary structure. So each nucleic acid will have its own unique sequence of bases which is known as its primary structure and this is the primary structure that carries the genetic information. Now it's generally read from the sugar with the free 5, five prime phosphate to the sugar with the free 3 prime phosphate. So it's often written using the using the letters to the bases that represent the sequence. For example, we write 5 prime A C G T 3 prime. So we write always from 5 prime to 3 prime whenever we write the primary structure of a genetic sequence. So pause the video right here and try to determine uh, whether what is the from 5 prime to 3 prime what is the structure here and try to write it this way. next is the DNA double helix. So the DNA double helix here is involves the formation of a hydrogen bond between the nitrogen bases between the between the nitrogen bases that are present on the one prime carbon. So what happens here is that it is determined that adenine is, adenine is generally pairs with thymine in DNA. Guanine also pairs with cytosine in the DNA. So this is generally called as the Chargaff rules which can be summarized as that the number of purine molecules should be equal to the number of pyrimidine molecules. It should always be in a one to one ratio. So here A always pairs with T, G always pairs with C. So these are percentage of bases in DNAs of selected organisms. Notice that humans have one of the most highest uh, percentage of bases in DNAs uh, followed by other organisms. Now the bonding here is a hydrogen bond. Where is the hydrogen bond coming from? Is that if you take AT in the DNA 
the at bond comes from the hydrogen and oxygen so the hydrogen on adenine and the oxygen on thymine and nitrogen on adenine and hydrogen on thymine so at involves two hydrogen bonds so at formation involves two hydrogen bonds and these are what we call complementary base pairs because they are always going to be bonding with each other they cannot bond with another structure for example adenine cannot bond with cytosine or adenine cannot bond with guanine so when you take guanine and cytosine guanine and cytosine these are also complementary base pairs so here it involves three hydrogen bonds so gc involves three hydrogen bonds so gc involves formation of three different hydrogen bonds so the double helix of dna is created by first the primary structure where we get 5 prime to 3 prime on one of these one of these helices one of the structures and 5 prime to 3 prime on the reverse on the other side so one complements the other and the complementing DNA helix structure is formed because of the hydrogen bonds that form between the structures here. And these hydrogen bonds are the ones that result in the formation of a double helix structure. So you have an outside you have the sugar phosphate bonding and on the inside you have the hydrogen bonding between the nitrogen bases. So the DNA here enters into a double helix structure. So it contains two strands of nucleotides that are forming a double helix structure like a spiral staircase. So it generally has two strands held together by hydrogen bonds between the, at, between the bases AT and GC. And it also has bases along one strand that complement the bases on the other. So remember that A always bonds with T and G always bonds with C. For example, if you have 5 prime, A, C, G, T, 3 prime, on reverse side, always it has to come from the complementary side. So it will become 5 prime, T bonds with A, G bonds with C, C bonds with G, A bonds with T, and 3 prime. So remember that this bonding should always be with a complementary pair. So one, one strand complements the other strand. So this is the idea behind the structure here. So try this one, pause the video right here. Remember that A should bond with T and G should bond with C. So pause the video here and try to determine the complementary chain. Next, let's talk about DNA replication. So the function of the DNA is to, in the cells is to preserve the genetic information. So the way it can preserve it is to transfer the genetic information to new cells as the strands of DNA are copied. So it basically copies the DNA. So the strands in the original DNA or the parent DNA separate to allow the synthesis of a complementary DNA strand. So this process first begins with unwinding of the double helix structure by breaking down the hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases. And then the resulting single strands act as templates for the synthesis of new complementary strands of DNA. So this here is the process of DNA replication where it replicates itself to create copies of itself. So within the nucleus, so you have nucleotide triphosphates on the template strand from hydrogen bonds with their complementary bases and the phosphodiester linkages are formed between the nucleotides as the hydrogen bonds form between the bases. Always remember that T forms hydrogen bonds with A and G forms hydrogen bonds with C. So in each new DNA strand, you will have one strand of double helix from the parent DNA and one is the newly synthesized DNA strand. And you have two new daughter DNA strands that are exact copies of the parent DNA that are going to end up forming. And the complementary base pairing ensures that the correct placement of the bases in the daughter DNA strand always occurs. So this is the process of DNA replication. Now the direction of replication involves, so during the DNA replication, you have an enzyme that creates this replica, replicas, we call it helicase. So helicase is the enzyme that unwinds the parent DNA at several sections. So this is the one that unwinds the parent DNA. And the DNA polymerase is the enzyme that catalyzes the replication process. So think of it like a replication forks, it starts cutting them up and attaching them to new strands. 
Now the polymerase here moves in three to five direction, three prime to five prime direction, catalyzing the formation of new postpaster bonds. You will get two types of uh, two strands. One is the leading strand, the other is the lagging strand. Leading strand is a direct process where it attaches itself, but one ends up becoming a lagging strand because it grows in the reverse direction. These types of sections are generally synthesized in short sections. We call them Okazaki fragments. So for that Okazaki fragments, we use another enzyme called DNA ligase to join the Okazaki fragments to create the final structure of the DNA. So this is the process of how it looks like. So one notice that helicase is the enzyme that splits it up and you have DNA polymerase that's basically uh, complementing the base plate to create the DNA. But you have one side, it, could, it is basically taking from 5 prime end to 3 prime end. But here it is, it's taking it from three prime, 5 prime to 3 prime. So it's in the reverse direction. So what we'll have to do is that it will create a lagging strand. So the lagging strand basically attaches up, attaches parts of it. So the DNA ligase fills up the gaps that the DNA polymerase cannot fill up during the process. So what are the enzymes involved? First is the helicase enzyme. It involves the breaking of the hydrogen bonds of the two parent DNA strands at the replication fork which gives two, DNA, two separate DNA strands. Second is the single strand binding protein which is the one that attaches to the separate parent strands to keep them apart and the bases exposed. So next you have primase. Primase is involved in the lagging strand. It is basically synthesizing short DNA seg RNA segments called primers. They become the starting points for the DNA polymerase. So the DNA polymerase involves the catalysis of the formation of the phosphodiester bonds between the new DNA strands of the 3' prime to the other complementary nucleotides. Now DNA polymerase adds nucleotides continuously to 5' to 5 prime to 3' prime, but at each primer on the lagging strand DNA polymerase will form short separate segments reaches the next primer at the start. So the DNA ligase is the one that basically create basically checks the lagging strand and make sure that it bonds the lagging strand to to not it be separate. So pause the video right here and try to answer these questions. Next, let's talk about the next process which is transcription. So a typical ribosome in general contains a small subunit and a large subunit. So the subunits generally are the ones that create the final protein. So let's start with RNA and DNA. So RNA here is generally the one that makes up most of the nucleic acid that is found in the cell. So RNA here transmit the genetic information from the DNA to operate the cell. So think of RNA as a specific set of instructions that are taken from the DNA to create entities in the cell. So there are several types. So they also differ from DNA in the following ways. First, the sugar is a ribose and the sugar in DNA is a deoxyribose. So the base uracil replaces thymine and the RNA molecules are single stranded and DNA molecules are double stranded and RNA molecules are generally much smaller than DNA molecules. Remember the first thing that it's a single stranded one which means that it is really small as well as these are not that, that large in comparison to DNAs. Now there are three, ty three major types of DNA. 5% of RNA is the messenger RNA or mRNA which is the one that is used to carry genetic information from DNA to the ribosomes. 15% of the RNA is transfer RNA which is tRNA which translates the genetic information in the mRNA into an amino acid sequence for the protein. 80% of the RNA is ribosomal RNA or rRNA which is most of the abundant type of RNA. It is the one that combines with proteins to form ribosomes. Let's start with tRNA. So tRNA can be drawn as a two dimensional clover leaf. So it shows more twists than illustrated. The L shape of the tRNA is in the three dimensional model. So tRNA has an acceptor stem at the three prime end with the nucleotide sequence ACC where an enzyme attaches by the amino acid forming the ester bond to free the OH group. So it generally contains what we call an anticodon which is a series of three bases that complements the three bases of the mRNA. Remember that the transcription process always starts at A. So this is the structure of a tRNA in general and it has much more twists than it is shown here and on one end you have the anticodon loop and on the other end you have the acceptor stem. Acceptor stem is the point where the transcription starts. 
So what is the process of transcription here? So in the nucleus, we are basically what we are doing in the transcription is we are converting the genetic information in the DNA into a protein. So what is what is going to have first happen is that first the the data that the genetic information needed from the gene is copied from the DNA, and the the, the process in the process we make mRNA. Yama this process of converting DNA into mRNA is called transcription. So here the mRNA molecules move out of the nucleus into the cytosol where they bind with ribosomes and ribosomes are the materials that convert the mRNA into proteins. So this process of converting mRNA into proteins is called translation. So remember that we discussed in total three processes. Replication where DNA copies itself and creates two parent two daughter chains two daughter uh, two daughter uh, structures transcription which is the conversion of dna into mrna and translation which is the conversion of mrna into proteins so the mrna here is the process the transcription the process of uh, replication occurs inside the nucleus transcription also occurs inside the nucleus but translation occurs in the cytosol outside the nuclear nucleolus now the trna here molecules convert the information in the mrna into amino acids in the process called translation so what will happen first first the nucleus either replicates itself and the second process that it can do is transcribe so the transcription process involves the creation of a pre mrna processing unit so where it creates a mrna the mrna then comes out of the nucleus into the cytosol where the mrna bonds with the ribosome and the ribosome converts the sequence of mrna into amino acid process sequence and the amino acid sequence creating the process of primary structure of the protein so remember that translation involves the conversion into primary structure and the structure then evolves to create more com com more uh, complex structures so in transcription here you are basically taking a section of the dna containing the gene and we are unwinding it and the enzyme rna polymerase uses the dna template strand to form a new mrna using the bases that are complementary to the dna template so the mrna here is synthesized using the complementary base pairing where we basically use u instead of uracil instead of thymine so the lurie formed mrna here first then moves out of the nucleus to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm so the basically it cuts a part of the it splits the dna at a part of the strand and then synthesizes the mrna and then moves out and then the mrna then creates the pre mrna that goes outside the nucleus the, finally creating the new process for translation so in eukaryotes the dna contains exons that codes for proteins and introns that do not code for proteins so there are two types that are involved so you have exons and introns a pre rna is formed that includes non coding introns the non coding introns are generally the ones that are removed so the exons are joined to form mrna which goes to the ribosome with the information for synthesis of the protein remember that exons are the ones that are going to end up creating the mrna not introns so we basically have exons and introns combined finally during the transcription process you are basically splitting the structure and finally creating in the pre pre mrna processing place we remove the introns and finally bond only the exons finally creating the mrna strand so the structure that has exons and introns is called as premature or pre mrna and once the removal of introns happens we call it the mature mrna so how do you regulate the transcription process the regulation of mrna synthesis is controlled at the transcription level by a specific mrna that is synthesized when the cell requires a particular protein now the transcription of a gene requires the rna polymerase to bind to dna in plants and animals a group of protein complexes called as a transcription factor first recognize and bind to the promoter sequences so the other proteins called activators bind with the transcription factor complex to increase the rate of rna transcription so it involves multiple processes first you have an activator activator is the first one that attaches then you have the transcription factor that attaches finally you have the rna polymerase that detects the 
activator and the transcription factor finally ending ending up creating the mrna strand now remember that here also it involves complementary formation which means that a here from bonds with g a here bonds with u in terms of the mrna strand you have g bonding with c so use this strand and try to create the template strand of the mrna next let's talk about the genetic code and protein synthesis now the function of different types of rna in the cell is to facilitate the task of synthesizing the proteins an activated trna with anti codon agu bonds are to serine at the acceptor step so what is happening here first we discuss that there are pre mrna and the pre mrna splits itself and finally creates the mature mrna so once the mature mrna comes out of the process here process here so the genetic information encoded in the dna is then transcribed and processed into mature mrna molecules and these molecules move out of the nucleus to the ribosomes so ribosomes are protein factories so think of them as protein factories so these are the structures that these are the proteins that involve the formation of the protein structure itself so in the second process the mrna will leave the nucleus attaches to a ribosome so the ribosome will detect the will read the genetic information in the mrna and translate it to create a sequence of amino acids into a protein so the ribosome here is going to convert the mrna's message into a sequence of proteins we call it the primary structure so the genetic code here consists of three nucleotides or triplets in the mrna we call them codons so these codons are the ones that specify the amino acids that are in the sequence amino acids and their sequence in the protein so there is a different codon for all of the 20 amino acids that are needed to build a protein so the genetic code here has stop signals so the stop signals are uga uaa uag so that signals the termination of the protein synthesis now It, the genetic code has a start codon the start codon is aug remember that this is the start starting codon that signals the start of protein synthesis so remember that all of the genetic message is not needed for the creation of the protein it only starts when it detects aug formation so the genetic code's aug formation is the first part where the ribosome detects the creation of starts the protein synthesis so for example here to determine the amino acid sequence in the code so we refer to the code here and we split each of the amino acids into three 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 base pairs so three pair a pair of three a group of three so ccu here represents proline agc represents serine gga represents glycine and cuu represents leucine so the final mrna here is going to attach these these of these structures to create proline serine so proline proline serine glycine leucine so this is the polynucleotide that it generates from the mrna sequence that we have here now what are the stop points where it can stop so when you have uaa and uag it stops uga also it stops but all of the following sequences are representation of particular protein here uuu and uuc can attach to create phenyl phenylalanine you have ggu ggc gga ggg create glycine so the third letter here the first letter and the third letter are the ones that can decide what type of structure it creates so now the molecules of the trna what are what what is the trna trna is the transfer rna are the ones that pick specific amino acids to according to their anti codons remember that the codons are the ones on the rna that are detected by the anti codons the anti codons are the ones that are going to Uh, ask the trna to bring the specific amino acids that are needed to bond to the structure now the trna activation will occur when the correct amino acid is attached to the trna now you have the rna and trna so a start codon binds the first trna carrying the amino acid methionine to the mrna as the ribosome moves along the mrna here a new amino acid forms a peptide bond to the growing protein chain 
So this is the fifth step. So first the structure here, once the anticodon attaches itself, it bonds with the structure and then finally moves it along. So this way it creates the primary structure of the protein. So eventually a ribosome encounters the stop codon when no corresponding tRNAs which signal the termination of the polypeptide synthesis and it release from the ribosome. Then the 3RNA re-enters the pool of free tRNA ready to be recharged with a new, re new amino acid. So this is the idea of translation inside the nucleic acid. So to summarize this, you have the DNA informational strand, you have the DNA template strand inside the nucleus that generally ends up creating the mRNA. The mRNA then creates the tRNA strand which is going to complement itself and finally the polypeptide amino acids are generally finally the ones that are created by the ribosome. So they have given us this strand here. So first thing to remember is that it only starts the creating process we have the mRNA. So first write down the anticodon sequence. So anticodon sequence becomes 5 prime, C becomes A, A becomes U, G becomes C, U, A, C, G, G, U and you have 3 prime. So it starts when it notices A, U, G. So when the sequence starts, so notice that here, I am sorry, they have already given us the mRNA sequence, I am sorry. So this is the sequence they have given us. So where would they, where would you start now? So first you have the 5 prime. So the 5 prime and 3 prime are already in the structure, always read from 5 prime to 3 prime. So GCC here represents alanine, GUA here represents valine and GAC here represents aspartic acid. So you end up with al alanyl, valyl, aspartic acid. Next let's talk about genetic mutations. So a common example of this is a peacock with albinism. So it does not produce the melatonin needed for its uh, to make its bright colors for its feathers. So mutation here is basically a change in the nucleotide sequence of the DNA and it may end up resulting in the change of the sequence of amino acids that affect the structure and function of the cells. So these are generally from mutagens such as radiation and chemicals, possibly some viruses as well. So when a mutation severely alters the proteins or enzymes, the new cells may not survive or the person may exhibit a disease, we call this a genetic effect. Now the normal DNA sequence produces the mRNA that provides instructions for the correct series of amino acids in the protein. Now if there is a kink in any of these processes that ends up resulting in the formation of the mutation. So a point mutation is the replacement of one base in the template strand of the DNA with another. This may cause different amino acid sequence to be inserted into the polypeptide. Now there is two the other type of mutation is a silent mutation where and when a point mutation does not change the amino acid sequence. So a point mutation will change the alter the amino acid sequence because it changes the DNA, it changes the mRNA and then ends up changing the amino acid sequence. The next one is a deletion mutation. So where a base is deleted from the normal order of bases in the template strand of the DNA and all the codons here are following are changed producing a different sequence of amino acids from that point. There is another one called insertion, insertion, insertion mutation where a base is inserted into the normal order of bases in the template strand of the DNA and here all the codons follow that follow are changed producing a different sequence of amino acids from that point. So this is an example of a deletion mutation where one of the amino acids is uh, one of the base pairs is gone. So if one of the bases is gone then it results in the formation of a different change in the uh, mutation of the amino acid chain. So what are the effects of mutation? So some mutations do not cause significant changes in the primary structure of the protein. So for dastric structures in the amino acid sequence, the structure of the resulting protein may lose its biological activity. The proteins or the enzymes may no longer catalyze the reactions and substances may accumulate in the cell until they are poisonous. 
So, for example, DNA undergoes a mutation either by X-rays, UV light, mutagens or viruses and that alters the DNA. The altered DNA can create defective proteins. The defective proteins then can cause genetic diseases or cancer. So, genetic diseases are part generally formed due to germ cell mutation. Cancers are generally caused due to somatic cell mutation. So, genetic diseases result in a defective enzyme caused by mutation in the genetic code. If the enzyme that converts tyrosine to melanin, melanin is defective, no melanin is produced and this here is called as albinism which results in the formation of a white hair, no color, uh, no skin pigments at all. So the tyrosine here is needed for the formation of melatonin. If there is no tyrosine formation, this ends up uh, hurting the uh, creation of melanin itself. So remember that if there is no phenylalanine to phenylpyruvate, so if there is no phenyl phenylalanine hydrox hydro hydroxylase, there is no py tyrosine. If there is no tyrosine, there is no melanin. So this is this is what results in the formation of albinism. So these are some examples of different genetic diseases, some ranging from really small to really uh, terrifying diseases. For example, uh, galactosemia is the transferase enzyme required for the metabolism of galactose 1-phosphate. So it results in the accumulation of galactose 1-phosphate which leads to cataracts and mental retardation. So it happens in about one of every 50,000 births. You have cystic fibrosis which is a mutation in the gene of the protein that regulates the production of stomach fluid and mucus. So it is one of the most common inherited diseases in children where you can get a thick mucus secretion making the difficulty, difficulty in breathing and can create, can block uh, the pancreatic function. You have Down syndrome which is the leading cause of mental retardation uh, which occurs in about one of every 800 live births. So the mother's age generally strongly influences its occurrence. So the mental and physical problems including heart and eye defects are the result of these three chromosomes and usually number 21 is the one that uh, instead of a pain. You have familial hypocholesterol, hypocholesterolemia which occurs when you have a mutation in the gene on the chromosome 19 which results in high cholesterol levels that can lead to early coronary heart diseases in people with 30 to 40 year olds. You have muscular dystrophy, you have Huntington disease, you have sickle cell anemia, you have hemophilia, you have Tay-Sachs syndrome. These are all examples of genetic diseases. So pause the video right here and try to answer these questions. Next, let's talk about recombinant DNA. So DNA here can be used in genetic engineering and that permits scientists to cut and recombine DNA fragments to form recombinant DNA. So the identification of a person by examining the bands on a film that represents the fingerprints here. So the in process of in preparing the recombinant DNA, we are taking a DNA fragment of one, of one organism and then we combine it with the DNA from another. So we have restriction enzymes that are used to cleave a gene. Cleave here basically means to cut a gene from a foreign DNA and open DNA plasmids in Escherichia coli or E. coli. So the DNA fragments are then mixed with the plasmids in E. coli and the ends are joined with ligase and the new gene is in the altered DNA produces a protein. That protein is what ends up creating the final answer that you need. So the recombinant DNA is formed by placing a gene from another organism in the plasmid DNA of the bacterium. So this causes the bacterium to produce non-bacterial DNA. So the non-bacterial DNA is then the result of uh, what are the uh, that can be used to form different products. So these are common products that we have seen. First one is human insulin that is produced by decombinant DNA. You have erythropoietin which is used to treat anemia and stimulate production of erythrocytes. You have human growth hormone which is used to stimulate growth. You have interferon which is used to treat cancer and viral diseases. You have tumor necrosis factor or TNF which is used to destroy tumor cells. You have monoclonal antibodies which is one of the easiest ways to transport drugs needed to treat cancer and transplant rejection where we take antibodies from one person and try to uh, create antibodies for another person. You have epidermal growth factors which are used to stimulate healing of wounds and burns. You have human blood clotting factor 8 which is used to treat hemophilia and allows blood to clot normally. You have interleukins which can stimulate immune system and treat cancer. You have pyourokinase which is used to destroy blood clots and treat myocardial infractions. You have influenza vaccine which is also created by recombinant DNA used to prevent influenza. You have hepatitis B vaccine 
which is used to pre prevent viral hepatitis. And the next process that is used in the DNA, DNA process is PCR or polymerase chain reaction. So a polymerase chain reaction involves making it, so it makes it possible to produce multiple copies of a DNA in a short time. So it separates the sample DNA strands by heating first and then mixes the separate strands of the, with the enzymes and nucleotides to form complementary strands. And if you repeat the process enough times, it can create a large sample of the DNA. And the polymerase chain reaction allows screening for defective enzymes. It can be used to screen for genes associated with breast cancer. So multiple defects in two known breast cancer genes are called BRCA1 and BRCA2 are generally used to correlate to a high risk of breast cancer. Next process is DNA fingerprinting. So DNA fingerprinting is used in the restriction enzymes to cut a DNA sample into smaller fragments. And then the sample is placed on a gel and separated using electrophoresis. The banding pattern on the gel is called as a DNA fingerprint and it is unique to each individual. So the next one was the human genome. The human genome project was the first project that was completed in 2003 and it showed that our DNA is composed of about 3 billion bases and 21,000 genes coding for the protein which represents only about 3% of the total DNA. And it has since identified stretches of the DNA that code for other RNA molecules. So, so much of our DNA is used to regulate the genes and serve as recognition sites for proteins. And it has been assigned a function leading to understanding errors in DNA replication, transcription or regulation. And the last step is viruses. So viruses are small particles of RNA and DNA containing up to 3 to 200 genes. Examples of these are the Epstein-Barr virus, herpes virus that can cause in humans. So viruses are really small particles of DNA or RNA. We classify them into two types of viruses, whether one is a DNA virus, the other is an RNA virus. So that require host cell to replicate the cell function, to replicate and cause infection. So replication involves creation of new molecules. So when a virus infects a cell, it transfers the genetic material into the cell and uses the cell as a factory and then ends up creating more and more new viruses. And it generally uses up the cell to make sure that it uses up the entire energy of the cell and finally kills the cell. And the newly formed viruses then in fact uh, then uh, attack the new cells then finally creating more and more viruses. So they can replicate only in cells by taking over the machinery and materials necessary for protein synthesis and growth. So a virus infection, virus causes infection when you have an enzyme in the protein coat of the virus that makes a hole in the outside of the host cell. The virus enters the cell and the viral nucleic acid mixes with the materials in the host cell. A protease processes, processes the proteins to produce a protein coat encasing of the new viral RNA or DNA. Then the new virus particles are released from the cell and then ready to infect more cells. So common viruses, you have common cold, which is generally called by over 100 types of viruses called as the coronaviruses. The, the corona word corona comes from the uh, idea that they look like crowns. So they have like uh, big crowns on them. And you have rhinoviruses, there are about 110 types of them. You have influenza, which is caused by ortho, orthomyxovirus. You have warts that are caused by papo, papovirus, herpes by herpes virus, HPV by human papilloma virus, leukemia, cancer and AIDS by retroviruses, hepatitis by hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C viruses, mumps by paramyxovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, obviously again Epstein-Barr virus, chickenpox is caused by varicella zoster virus. So these are different viruses and the diseases that can, they can cause. Now, there is a process called reverse transcription that is important. So in reverse transcription, what is going to happen is that a retrovirus is an example of a virus that can create this process in your cell, where it takes the viral RNA, it generally it does not contain any DNA, but only contains RNA. So, but for it to undergo the transcription process, it needs the, it needs the DNA. So what it does is that to replicate itself, it basically takes the viral RNA here, uses reverse transcript trace to create a viral DNA strand. The viral DNA strand then creates the complementary DNA strand, finally ending up creating the new DNA using the nucleotides and the enzymes in the host cell to synthesize the
new viral particles resulting in the formation of new new viruses so one of those viruses is hiv virus hiv virus is an example of a retrovirus so it infects and destroys the t4 lymphocyte cells and it leaves the immune system unable to destroy the harmful organisms because t cells themselves are the ones that uh, that are responsible for protecting your body but if the t cells themselves are infected then that is the where you end up leaving the immune system to ruins and it's generally associated with increased chance of developing a pneumonia skin cancer associated with aids so retroviruses after a retrovirus injects its viral rna it forms a dna strand by viral reverse transcription remember that dna to rna is called transcription so the reverse transcription here is from rna to dna so the single stranded our dna gen then forms a double stranded dna we call that a pro virus which is then incorporated into the host cell dna finally ending up creating the replication so where the cell replicates the pro virus produces the viral rna needed to produce more virus particles so this is the uh, function of a retrovirus so one of those is uh, inhibited by protease inhibitors so protease enzyme is the one that inhibits one of these processes uh if the if they are overcome then that is where you end up creating the reverse transcription processes so one of the methods that is being used in the aids treatment here is based on attacking the hiv at different points in its life cycle first it's to developing the nucleoside analogs that mimic the structures of the nucleosides used for dna synthesis and then drugs that are based on nucleoside analogs to treat include azt ddl ddc and d40 so which are similar to the original ones that are present on the virus so we use nucleoside analogs that stops the viral dna from undergoing reverse transcription and to stop the reverse transcription process so they can be done by using entry inhibitors where you can stop the entry of the virus you can use reverse transcription inhibitors where you can stop the replication of the virus you have protease inhibitors which can stop the new virus formed to come out of the cell so you have lexiva which metabolizes slowly to provide amprenovir so which is the hiv protease inhibitor next is the chemistry link to health let's start with cancer so when cell begins to grow they multiply without control and then invade the nearby cells and appear as a tumor now the tumors here are limited to what we call there are limited ones that are called benign and there are ones that can invade other tissues interfering with the normal body function we call them cancerous ones so these can be caused by chemical and environmental factors ultraviolet or medical radiation oncogenic viruses so for example epstein barr virus is the one that can, and can cause herpes 4 virus and epstein barr virus can cause viral cancer in humans so most of the cancers are generally caused by environmental and chemical substances we call them carcinogens and include aniline dyes cigarette smoking and asbestos you have aflatoxin which is the tumor site for liver aniline dyes can create the bladder bladder cancer arsenic can cause skin and lung cancer asbestos can cause lung and respiratory tract cancer cadmium can cause prostate and kidney cancer you have chromium that can cause lung cancer nickel can cause lung and sinus cancer nitrites can cause stomach cancer and vinyl chloride can cause liver cancer these are what we call carcinogenic substances you have oncogenic viruses that can cause the disease as well for example human t cell lympho lymphotropic virus type 1 or htlv1 can cause leukemia dna viruses such as epstein barr virus can cause burkitt's lymphoma lymphoma which is the cancer of the white blood b cells and you can also cause nasopharyngeal carcinoma and hodgkins disease you have hepatitis b virus which can cause liver cancer herpes simplex virus can cause cervical and uterine cancer papilloma virus can cause cervical colon cancer and genital warts so pause the video right here and try to answer these questions
So with that, we end our lecture on nucleic acids and protein synthesis. And this is the concept map of everything that we have discussed in this lecture. So with this, we end our lecture on nucleic acids and protein synthesis.